Okay, so hello and welcome to um, the fourth practical class in discrete mathematics. Uh, today we'll finish with um, Turing and Graph's previous task and go further to polynomial computations. So for those who are viewing this online, the corresponding links will be downwards in the description of the video. For the previous uh, task on uh, Turing and graphs, uh, are there any questions or problems you wish to consider right now? Yeah, great. Okay, so uh, let's discuss a problem five. Like problem five A, five five A we have discussed already, five B and five C. Okay, so for five B. Mm -hmm. oh, uh, here we have two, de two vertices of degree three and three vertices of degree two. Two of degree three and three vertices of degree two. There exists a graph of uh, the following with the following degrees of vertices. How do you think? Yes. Uh, maybe you could draw it on the gem board. Yeah, this is the correct answer. And now let's look at 5C. So here you have 1 of 2, 2 of... Uh, 1 of 1, 2 of 2, 1 of 3, and 2 of 5. So let me write this down here. So 1 of 1, 2 of degree 2, Next, uh, one of three and two of five. One. So before we go forward, let me uh, just do the sanity check. So the sum of degrees is as follows. You have one plus two multiplied by two plus three a plus 2 multiplied by 5. So what is this? It's 1, 5, 8, and 10. So it's 18, right? This is even. So the handshake lemma is okay here. But does this graph really exist? Yeah, it, it could yeah, not exist. It could not exist. Why? Uh, because uh, there is a two vertices of degree 5 and one vertices of degree 1. It's... Uh, it could, it's could not be. Yes, we do not consider multigraphs here. So, um, if you have, to, so what is the total number of vertices? So, the total number of vertices is 1, 2, 1, 2. Uh, so, uh, this is 6, right? So, there are 6 vertices. And if a vertex is of degree 5, then it should be connected to all other vertices, right? And so this vertex, for example, is of degree 1, and therefore these are already okay. They have their degree. But there is another vertex of degree 5, uh, which is somewhere here, and this vertex should also be connected to each of them in particular to this one. And this will yield contradiction because you will have degree at least two. By the way, does there exist a multigraph with the following property? 
Okay, let's then uh, uh this question. And uh, for no, this is not us. Uh, for this one, for problem six, well, uh, okay. here we yeah. Question comment. Uh, five C. Am I right? Uh, you asked about uh, multigraph. Could it exist? Yeah, about multigraph. Yes. Yeah, it could. Uh, could you draw it, please, then, just to close this question? Yeah, um, one second. Oh, no. no. It's like... But you have two versions of degree one right now. Mm -hmm. So, yep, here is one, two, three, five. One, two, three, five. And for example, uh, no, 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 no. It, it's, it's too much. I think. One, two, three, five, six. Now you have. No, I think this should be removed. Um, um, if I okay. so two two no no if you just just like that if you do it like this this it's it's four it's it's four, no, four. one two three five one two three you skip four. number four it's four it should be five but it's four why is why is it four ah because it's four. Two, three, yeah, it's four, yeah, right, you're right. So we'll draw like this. And then we we'll have one, two, three. One, two, three, four, five. Yes, five. Here is five. So here is three, two, one, two, one. Yeah, right. You're right here. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So, yes, for multigraph, this is possible. For a normal graph, this is impossible. And now for the Euler path, well, here it's in the first one you should have written this as a multigraph, because um, uh, otherwise it's non-existent. And actually, 6a is the classical multigraph of Euler, and I will try to draw it of the next frame. It's frame two. Um, so this is the classical problem of uh, Königsberg. So uh, Königsberg is now Kaliningrad. Uh, original original like that. So this is an umlaut here. And uh, in the old town of Königsberg there were two islands. And let's denote these as vertices will write right here. This will be vertex C A. This is B. These are the um, banks of the river. And here is C, C and D. And the edges, uh, there were bridges connecting them. So uh, the bridges were, so there were two bridges here, uh, two bridges here, a bridge which connected these two guys, and one bridge here, one bridge here. And if you draw it as a graph, uh, then you can have to just traverse edges through all these bridges. Yep. Here, this goes here, this goes here, and this goes here. So the question of Euler was to traverse this graph, or this multigraph actually, visit each bridge exactly once. So, and this is exactly the parameters which we have here. So we have um, three vertices of degree three and one of degree five. So here, uh, a, B, and D are of degree 3, and C is of degree 5. And this is not an Euler graph, uh, because uh, if you uh, start traversing that, uh, each time you traverse a vertex in between, so let's draw it yellow, so here we have a vertex, say C, it has degree 5. And suppose that this vertex is not the end and not the beginning of our path. So this means that we should enter and then exit, enter and then exit. 
and here you enter, and you get stuck here. But we know that this is not the end and not the beginning. So therefore, each, uh, so uh, we can say it like that, that in an oil path, um, each in vertex should have even degree. And this is exactly violated here because here all vertices are odd. So one of them could be the starting point, another one could be the ending point, but in the in the mm, in the middle you will have also odd vertices which will lead you to contradiction. By the way, this uh, problem was uh, presented to the at that time to the Emperor of Russia, and Kaiser uh, actually solved it by building in an order to build another bridge. And this bridge was exact, actually built, and it's called Kaiser Brick or Emperor's Bridge in Königsberg. But some of the building of the bridges were demolished, and the, if you ever happen to visit Kaliningrad, also new bridges, of course, were built. Uh, you can check whether it is oil or not now. Mm, and for the second question, 6b, does anyone want to uh, to show this? Sorry, which one? Which one? Six uh, B. Okay, then I, if no one wants to show it, I will postpone that, and we'll go further, and then we'll maybe return to this uh, in the end of the class if we have time. And seven, the answer is yes, and uh, you can just easily. Construct it if you wish, and uh, I think we will not discuss it. Okay, so new problem sheet. Well, this is the link. It's on the chat, and also will be in the description of the video. Um, it's polynomial computations. So uh, here we recall the standard definition of worst time, worst case time complexity. So t of x with this index m here, where m is the denotation of the Turing machine, is deterministic. Uh, this tm is the uh, number of steps which the machine performs on running on x. It could be infinite. And the maximal value is the following. And uh, the first question is that if the machine has uh, m states, k letters, and uh, uses at most this number of cells, then how to give an upper bound for the running time? So, um, the number of states, it's the size of Q, it is M. Uh, the number of letters of the O of average K. And you have S of length of X, which is a bound on what they call space. So, O memory, which is the number of. This is a bound, and we're asked whether what is the bound for the runtime. Provided that this is less than infinity, then we can provide an upper bound. So you have an, you are not allowed to use too many cells of memory. How much uh, time can you consume then? Okay, let's ask another question. Uh, how many configurations of a Turing machine could there be if you have this bound on the memory, on the number of cells used? Easier question, just combinatorics. So, what is the configuration of a Turing machine? It includes a state, right? So, you recall what is happening. So, you will have some A1, a2, AI, which is observed by this Q, and then you will have A, S of X, right? So this is the complete configuration of a Turing machine.
and is described by the following. Okay? Yes, this is the answer. The regression count is m multiplied by s of f and k to the power of uh, so uh, let me write this down here. So the number of the total number of configurations less or equal than well less or equal it could be actually equal but some of them could be unreachable. It's m multiplied by s. Let's call it just s. S is s of x and uh, multiplied by k to the power of s of x. Or let's just call it s so just for simplicity. So, uh, why? Uh, just because, uh, in order to define the configuration, we should first define the Q. And this is, uh, this is the number of states, which is M. Then you define the place where you put it in just one or two or three or I is it here or this one. So this is S. And K to the power of S is just the possible state of memory, so you say that this is here. And now I claim that if t of x is less than infinity, then uh, t of x is less or equal than this one. Why? Why is this so? Well, this is pigeonhole principle. That suppose your machine ran more than this number of steps. This means that in this run, uh, the number of steps is greater than the uh, total number of configurations possible. And therefore, in this run, we came across the same configuration twice. So we went further, further, further. This is some configuration. And then we go and then we return to it. But the machine is deterministic. So this means that it should go, so it, it, it came here to this configuration C0, it then it uh, returned to the configuration, but it's deterministic, so it should go the same direction. And it will go and go and go infinitely long, and this will violate this condition, that the machine should eventually stop. So if the machine stops, then, then it stops in this time. So this shows that if your space is polynomially bounded, so if you are operating, operating P space, then you operate in exponential time. And vice versa, this one is greater or equal than S. This is the easier bound because, well, if you have to, if you use uh, some cell of memory, you have to pay at least one step in order to occupy it. So this means that, well, it's S of X uh, minus the length of X itself, of course. But otherwise, you, you, can, you can just not use anything. But usually, S of X is greater than the length of X. So this is how you actually use it. Okay? So now let us consider two. Problem two, that you have two tapes, and at each step, uh, the Turing machine operates on each tape, and we have to give a bound for this machine in terms of a one-tape machine. So, uh, you would emulate a one-tape machine on a two-tape two machine using a one-tape machine. Let me again draw the picture. So we have one tape. You have another tape. And here you have this operating unit Q, which has two heads. So it observes an letter here, which is some AI, and there's some AK here, and it observes also this one. So this is a two tape machine. How do you think? How can you emulate this 
using a one take machine. Let's think for some minutes. Again, we have a two take machine, which uh, we denoted by M2. And we want to construct a machine denoted by M, which is a one take machine, which does the same computation. Does anyone have an idea how to do this? How could we squeeze, say, two tapes into one tape? Maybe we can... Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I hear. Uh, maybe we can replace every pair of um, symbols by one symbol and uh, somehow operate with this. Yes, this is the good first idea. So suppose you have symbol A here and symbol B here, and we want to unite them in a, in a way that here we'll have just one symbol on the tape. So in the new tape, which will appear here, you will have, instead of these two symbols, this tape will be like this. So this is uh, just a symbol which we'll call like this A, B, and then we'll do something like a box here. And actually this A, a B in the box, uh, this is just a pair of A and B. So what we will have here that your new alphabet gamma one this is going to be the first idea, is gamma 2, Cartesian by gamma 2. How do you think, is this sufficient? So yeah, all the letters will be sort of these two, two letters of two, so they will be pairs of the original letters. But how will the machine operate now? What is the problem? Well, the actual problem is as follows. So here you see that we had two pointers, one pointed here and the other pointed here. And, and the, the problem is that they could point to different places on these tapes. So here we'll have only one pointer. So we'll have again this operating block with this Q. Q could be the same. And it will point somewhere. So OK, it will point to AK, for example, here. But here we'll have something, and this something is not the same as this where it points here. So well, what should we do? How do you think? So actually what we did now, we emulated our machine in a sense, but we emulated it as a machine with one tape, but two pointers. So the other pointer should show somewhere here. And now the only way we could uh, proceed is to keep, to keep the pointer inside. So um, let's add an extra thing here. So here we add, I will write it down, then I will show you. It's just empty, pointer up, pointer down, pointer to side. So here we'll add these guys here. So we'll say that, for example, in this situation here, you will have another symbol, which says that here is a i and here is something, which, which is here. And we say that here we'll put this point to that this is up, this is down, and all others are zero. So there is zero, zero, zero. And this one is used if you are, uh, if both pointers point at the same, on the same spot. So we keep uh, the pointer inside the letter. We know where the pointer is. But what happens with the real pointer, which is here? And the idea is that we, uh, let me remove something from here. Uh, so we have uh, the following. We have this long tape. And sometimes, sometimes somewhere here we have uh, 
the first pointer. Uh, somewhere here after that, we have the second pointer. And we always keep the invariant that uh, our real point is, is somewhere on the left. So there is some cell here, which is the beginning of our real memory. So here only blanks come. And the real pointer comes here. And then how can you emulate your uh, run of your machine? How do you think? So each time it operates, so for example, suppose it operates here. It does something here. What should it do? It should go here, reach the uh, place where your pointer, which goes upwards, says, which is the first pointer. Then it should perform all the operations here. And then should return backward. Now it should operate here, so it goes forward. It operates here, does something, 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 then it goes backwards to the beginning. So finds this blank symbol here. What is the time? So each, so one step of the first machine <coughs> of M2 boils down to not, not greater than two multiplied by, or not two, I don't know what is the real constant here, so some constant uh, multiplied by the zone of the machine, depending on X, right? Because we have to perform the following steps. We start with, on the left, we find with the place where we have to perform our action somewhere here, and then we do it, and then we have to go backwards. So this is a linear function of the S of X. And now we have already done this. This is less or equal than C of T multiplied by T of X. And so in general, the T of M, so here's M2, Tm of x is less or equal than some constant multiplied by Tm2 of the length of x squared. Because each one step of the original machine with two tapes is simulated by the t steps of the uh, new machine. Is that clear? Any questions, comments here? So this again is one of the examples of the robustness of polynomiality. So you see that there are two quite similar computational models. There is M2, there is M. So M2 is the two-tape Turing machine, M is the one-tape Turing machine. If you compute something on M2 in polynomial time, you can compute the same on this more restrictive machine, which is M also in polynomial time, but the degree of the polynomial will grow, it will be multiplied by 2, because the polynomial is squared. So you see, you in, if you discuss uh, things on this level of abstraction, where you do not concretize whether you use Turing machines with one uh, tape, Turing machines with several tapes, random access memory, Minsky machines, and stuff like that, then you cannot say that we can do this in analog n, or we can do it in quadratic time, or cubic time because these translations between these models of computation, they could give you a difference in the degree of the polynomial. But nevertheless, you can say that it's all polynomial class. So Turing machines with different things, they uh, give the same class of polynomial computations. And the other thing is that even if we manage to prove exact bounds on the complexity of a given algorithm for, uh, say, one tape Turing machine, this is meaningless because they will be worse that we're supposed to have a more, a more complicated computer systems, even like several tape Turing machines. So now we discuss two tape Turing machine. Well, in the task, there is also do the same for more general case of K tape machine. So you can't think about that uh, at home, but I think that it's clear that the same should work. Instead of just having two objects you will have several letters in a cell, and in that cell you will get. Okay. Questions, comments? No. Okay, then let's go to task three. It's a question for you, and actually I think you already know the answer. Yeah. 
No. What? No? It doesn't. Yeah. Which one doesn't? For a disjunctive normal form. Not conjunctive. Yes, the question is, isn't this, it, it's really pretty straight, straightforward. Polynomial time algorithm for satisfiability over DNA. Yes, it's straightforward, exactly. So what is a DNF? Disjunctive normal form. So the DNF is a disjunction, a big disjunction of C1, Cn, C. And each Ci is a conjunction. So it's like P, example, and not Q and R, not R and S, right? So what so the DNF is satisfiable if at least one DNF is satisfiable if and only if at least one CI is satisfiable. So and CI is satisfiable if it is not contradictory. So this one is satisfiable. And for example, if we have this P and not P and something, something, this is not set. Because we have P and not P, this is not satisfiable. If you don't have this in the clause, you are satisfiable. So the algorithm works easily, absolutely trivially. It just traverses each uh, C1, C2, C3, and for each it checks its satisfiability just individually. Just checks for contradiction. If a clause is contradictive, we will remove it. If it is not contradictive, it's satisfiable, and therefore the whole DNF is satisfiable. It's the difference from CNF, because in the CNF you should satisfy all these clauses at once. And this is hard, and uh, there are methods to do this, but uh, for CNFs, this is not. Uh, we don't know how to do it in polynomial time, and we have good evidence that this theory of NP hardness, which shows that this is probably impossible. Okay, let's go further. Now about the graphs. Before going further, let's uh, do the definitions. So, what is a bipartite graph? Is it dvodolny uh, in Russian? In Russian, it's dvodolny. A bipartite graph. Let me just write this down. It's a graph where your vertices are a disjoint union of two subsets, which are called the parts of the graph, V1 and V2, and all edges go uh, only between these parts. So there is no possible edge inside the part. All edges go just from one to another. Okay, so what are examples of a graph? So this graph is bipartite. For example, this graph, just uh, pentagon. This is not bipartite, right? Because you say that this could be one, this could be two, one, two, and this would be one, and you will get this bad uh, edge, which goes inside part one. Okay, so how do you check? Uh, yeah, let me first ask the following question. We have just defined or recalled the notion of a graph being bipartite. And bipartite graphs are also quite important in uh, data representation because they represent um, relations between uh, different objects. So here you can see that the edges are a subset of V1 Cartesian V2. So, uh, examples of bipartite graphs include, for example, you have a student on one side and you have a professor who is a scientific advisor of the student on the other side. It's a bipartite graph. You can have, for example, uh, people and uh, goods that they buy in an internet shop and stuff like that. So, a specific kind of graph 
where vertices form two, say, or the standard, absolutely standard things like marriage and uh, things like that that you have, or dancing and stuff like that. So um, mm, this is important in data science, not only because there, there are situations where the um, graph is, the vertices are really separated into two, say, distinct parts, and they could be of really different nature. Like, I don't know, a person buys something in an internet shop, so there is a notion of buyer, with just a, a, a person or an organization, and there is an object which is uh, something that they buy, so it's just an object, and uh, they're not, not you, you cannot buy another custom, for example, or one, uh, one uh, a sense, sold object cannot buy another. Another thing which is good for bipartite graphs, that if your graph is bipartite, then some algorithmic problems, which are in general quite hard, they could be in Pihard, for example, even harder, for bipartite graphs, they could become simpler and they be polynomially solvable. Yep. So this is just the general information about bipartite graphs you should keep in mind. And uh, now there's a question for you concerning today's lecture. Actually, our notion of being a bipartite is connected to some other notion which we discussed uh, this morning at the lecture. What is the equivalent to? Okay. Yes, it's you, you can convert it into two coloring of graph. So uh, being bipartite is actually the same as two colorable. And we can also, of course, see. So you can say that this is the, for example, uh, blue part, this is the red part, and if your graph is bipartite, then all the vertices in the red part are declared to be red, all the vertices in the green part are declared to be green, and the condition of being bipartite is exactly the condition of correctness of this coloring. So the correctness condition is that each edge connects vertices of different color. And here this means that these vertices belong to different parts of the graph. So, um, vice versa, it also works. If a graph is too colorable, then we can just take all the red vertices and put it into V1, all the blue vertices they put it into V2, and we will get these two parts. So a graph could be drawn in a way that it doesn't look like a bipartite one. For example, I can draw something like square, then another square, then some isolated vertex, another isolated vertex. Here, I don't know. Yeah, let's stop at that, for example. And it's too colorable. So we can say that this is red, 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 red. This is blue, 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 blue. This is colored in two colors like that. And then you can carve out the parts. So the blue part will be like this. And the red part, let me remove this. The graph which is not too colorable and not bipartite. And let's uh, write, draw the red part here. So yeah, this sort of interleave into each other, but you can redraw this graph in an isomorphic way. So let's numerate its vertices, let these green vertices, uh, blue vertices be V1, V2, V3, and V4, and let these guys be U1, U2, U3, and U4, and you can draw it in a more natural way, more of the usual way, so here is U1, U2, U3, U4. So here we're going to be the Vs, V1, V2, V3, and V4. And now let's take a look. So this is the first part of the graph, which is red. The second one is blue. And uh, here you can see that U1 should be connected to V2 and V3. Next, uh, U2 
should be connected to V3 and V4. And uh, U3 is here is connected to V1, V2, and V3. Oh, sorry. So U1 is connected to U3, U, 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 U3, yes. V1, V2, and V4. So it's V1, V2, and V4 here. And finally, U4 is connected to V1 and V3. No, V4, V4 fails here. Yeah, no, 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 no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. U, um, yeah, let me move this guys. Up to U3. So U3 again, it's connected to V1, V2, V3, yes. So. And U4 is connected to V1 and V3. So if everything is okay, that this graph, which is a bipartite one, by just by design, you have two parts. This is v1, this is v2. Is this clear? That how how bipartiteness is connected to two colorability. And now uh, let's uh, continue with that. So what does it mean to be uh, to color? We will know it's the same as being bipartite. Is there a polynomial time algorithm for checking two colorability? Whether a graph can be two colored in two colors? Or the same that the graph is bipartite? How do you check it quickly? Uh, uh, can we like uh, assign uh, one color to a source vertex or to like the start vertex? Then we assign another color to all the neighboring, the neighbors of this vertex, and so on. Yes, this is the uh, standard algorithm which is usually used for doing proper tightness or for checking colorability in two colors. Uh, so, the, what is the idea? Uh, the idea is just to start with. Uh, oh. Clear. Yeah, the idea is to start with uh, one vertex, which we'll call the starting one, yes, and let's color it arbitrary. For example, we'll color it red. So um, then we see which vertices are connected to that, and uh, well, these vertices are not yet colored. We do not have loops because if you have a loop, you it is not too colorable. It's not colorable into any number of colors. And of course, we have to color them in the other color, which we denoted by blue. So next, we again look at the uh, next edges, which go somehow there. But probably this could. So the problematic case if there is an edge like that. If this, there is an edge which connects two vertices of the same color, we fail. And we say that it's not too colorable. Um, if it's not the case, then these guys are going to be colored in, of course, in red. And again, we proceed forward. So when we proceed forward, what can happen? So there could be a new vertex. This is going to be colored in blue. Um, there could be also a situation where this guy connects to something somewhere here, to a vertex which is already colored in blue. And uh, this, we just don't do nothing. We say it's already colored, it's okay. The bad case is when it goes backwards here, or it goes here. In such situations, we say that the graph is not colorable, and we fail. So, uh, using this structure, we can um, color one connected component at the same of the graph. So, probably there could also be other vertices which are just not connected to this uh, S. Then we just have to start with this as an, another S and do the same procedure. And of course, if this procedure succeeds, then uh, 
it uh, returns yes and it returns the correct coloring if this procedure fails then the following happens so these are levels so this is level zero this is level one this is level two and if the procedure fails then it says that there is a level of level k and level l such that k and l have the same color so suppose they're both red and we know that uh, here there is this illegal um, line and then we'll have this s here and we'll have this these are not just the paths so there are many of them and this is going to be an odd cycle so what is an odd cycle is um, that you start from s you take l steps here then you take one step here then you take k steps here l and k have the same parity so l plus k uh, should be even and l plus k plus one should be odd and if the, the even this cycle itself is not uh, too colorable because the colors should interleave on this cycle and they couldn't. So um, this is the maybe quick understanding of why this algorithm really works. So well, this is usually people call it greedy algorithm. Why greedy? Well, because it just starts coloring straightforwardly. We have a vertex, we can color it arbitrarily. The next vertex should be colored in a different color, and so, so, so on. Of course, this does not work for uh, three color ability, because if you have three colors, you don't know how to color your vertices. You have more choices, and uh, this yields uh, NP. Okay, so formally this, and morally, and of course, uh, absolutely, this solves problem number four. But I would like to ask you one more question. Uh, maybe you will guess. Um, the question is as follows. Could we use uh, some of the things we previously knew and we recalled on today's lecture in order to reduce this problem to something we already know, how to solve polynomially? So you see here we had to implement an, a graph theoretic algorithm. If we try to program it really, then you will have some well issues with how can you find all the vertices connected to the given one and stuff like that. We of course believe that it's all polynomial, but can we just formally reduce this to a problem we already know to be polynomially solvable? How do you think? To CNF, right. So could you please uh, say something more about that? How can two CNF help here? Yes, just like for three CNF and three colorability. So we can say that if we know that um, the problem of three colorability was polynomially m reducible to three set, right? This was uh, shown on today's lecture. But this is a very general fact. Well, this uh, suicide is by uh, Kuklevin and Satan. This is an uh, uh, NP, NP complete problem. So any NP problem reduces. But now you can um, reduce actually to color. Can be reduced to two set. I will show it now how it's performed. And you see that this guy is in P. It's polynomially solvable. Therefore, this guy is also polynomially solvable. And, uh, okay, maybe we'll ask Nadezhda, who showed that, who uh, gave this answer, just to write down this formula, this 2CNF, which will work. Could you do this? I will open frame number 8, which is the open one now. It's being cleared right now, and maybe Nadezhda will show us this formula phi 
So, well, it should be like this, that uh, she is bipartite, or the same is too coverable. If and only if this formula phi j is satisfiable, and this is a 2CNF. Okay, could you write this formula? Actually, I don't remember exactly what it was with uh, this itself being, but uh, we should consider um, that uh, every two, um, two vertices uh, that are connected are not uh, colored with the same color and also um, what was there? Well, actually, you can make it a bit easier. So, for each vertex vi in V, you could provide a value which is called bi, which says that uh, vi is blue. And not bi will just say that vi is red. So it's easier than the situation we had in the lecture, because in the lecture we had three colors, and we had to introduce three variables. One for B, VI is red, VI is green, VI is blue. But here we can introduce a value, for example, for being blue, and then red is just its negation. And therefore we do not need to uh, write down all these conditions on uh, the fact that each vertex has a color, and the color the, you could not have two colors, we say it's either blue or not blue. And not blue means red. And now we should write down the fact, phi g, uh, that uh, the formula um, uh, the formula that says that uh, no two adjacent vertices should be both blue or both red. So this is vi, this is vk. And again, this is just a conjunction for all edges. of the following two conditions. They should not be both blue. So not bi or not bk, right? And the second condition is that they should not be both red. How should we write this down? Exactly bi or bk. So this is the, the complete formula, by the way. Well, of course, it's a sort of short notation because this is a big, big conjunction here. But uh, it's clearly of polynomial size with respect to the graph. And uh, this um, formula exactly represents two colorability. And as for three colorability, the satisfying assignment for this formula, it is exactly a two color coloring of G. Because uh, if you color your graph into two colors, then you just take all the blue vertices and put BIs on them to be true. On the red vertices, you put this to be false. And then you just take any edge and see, okay, they are not both blue. Therefore, the first clause is true. They are not both not blue, and this is not both red. This means that at least one of them is blue. This is this clause. And vice versa, if you manage to satisfy this formula, uh, you will say that, okay, mm, this, uh, and so you will have some BIs and BKs, that some of them are true, some of them are false. For those of which that are true, you color the corresponding vertices into blue. For those who are false, you color them into red. And this condition exactly says that this is the correct coloring, that uh, you don't have any edge which is both red and both blue, right? And now this gives you a polynomial time algorithm, which is different from that what we did uh, previously, right? So how does this algorithm work? How do you think? Well, it takes G. It uh, transforms it to phi G with a polynomial transformation, and then it applies resolution. 
And then it starts start with your standard procedure of satisfying the CNF. So you can actually use your code, which you already implemented or be, are, are now implementing as your home task number one, which applies the resolution method and gives you uh, the result. And the result is either true or false. Uh, if it's true, then it's satisfiable, and the algorithm would also yield you a satisfying assignment. And this satisfying assignment is the two coloring of the graph. So this is another way of uh, uh, checking to colorability. And the interesting point here that we do not need to use any what they call graph algorithms. We do not need to traverse the graph showing how well the paths are there, and so, so on and so forth. We just take the graph formally as a set of edges, as a matrix, so this standard representation of a graph, which is also keep in mind. We will not, we'll not need that, but we'll just it will be useful. Um, that if your graph, well, it's it could have loops but not parallel edges, you can represent it like this. You will represent it as a Boolean matrix. This is Bij, which is the, here we'll have Vi, or here we'll have v, Vg. And so Bij is uh, one, if and only if, uh, the IVJ is an edge and uh, it's zero otherwise. So this is the connectedness matrix of the graph. So this represented a graph using a binary matrix of the size n by n. So the graph representation is usually, um, so if the graph is sort of dense, it has many edges, then the representation is quadratic with respect to the uh, number of vertices in the graph. But if the graph is sparse, so there are not so many edges. Then this representation is bad because it consumes too much memory. And people implement other representations, like for example, they could keep for each element of uh, the graph, for each vertex of the graph, they could keep just a list of the vertices which is connected to that. And if it is sparse, then um, you mm, will we'll, uh, we'll have less memory than keeping the matrix of uh, connectedness. Sparse in Russian is uh, dense is plot. So dense means that many vertices are connected. Okay, so we have coped with problem number four. And now, uh, well, about problem five and six, uh, First, uh, let's maybe try five, and for six it will go for your home thinking. Uh, but uh, let's uh, mm, we will uh, show the corresponding notions. I will just formulate them. Okay, let's uh, do problem five. That uh, checking for uh, oil existence of an oil cycle. So. Uh, Mm -hmm. So an oil cycle. So it's the cycle in the graph, which means that it traverses along the edges and returns to the same point and visits each edge exactly once. So how do you think? Uh, so this is only problem 5a. You have to determine for a given graph whether there exists an oil cycle. You do not need to construct it. You just have to de determine whether it exists. How do you think? Uh, um, as we know, the oil cycle exists only uh, if uh, every uh, vertex has uh, an even degree. So we just have to check this property. Yes, so you say that the oil cycle exists if and only if every vertex has even degree. Okay, and yes, the idea is easy that you have just to check all the uh, vertices and just check their degree. And this is usually trivial. Just by matrix, you can check this the other way. But let me draw you, you know, the following graph. This is one. 
is that it, the, all the stuff is one graph. All vertices are even, but does this graph have an Euler cycle? No, obviously it doesn't. Uh, of course, it's not. Okay, but we also have to check if it is, uh, don't know how in English, связный. Connected, yes. And okay. the graph is connected. In Russian it is связный, yes. So connectedness is also a necessary condition. Uh, why? Well, because um, otherwise you don't have, of course, any cycle which traverses all the graph. Connectedness, of course, is routinely checked. You can routinely check connectedness just by trying to traverse the graph. Actually, in our first algorithm for um, uh, for checking um, um, to colorability. We just take one vertex, we call it the starting one, and we start traversing the graph somehow and trying to reach all other vertices. And we just color it in one color. We just uh, say, okay, this vertex was just visited, we don't try to color it. And then we go uh, forward, 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 and we have two possibilities. Either we exhaust all the vertices, or we exhaust all the possible ways of finding them, but there are still other vertices in the graph, and in this case we say it's not connected. So checking for connectedness is easy, it's also done in polynomial time. And each vertex has an even degree, this is even easily checkable. But this equivalence, this is a theorem, and the question is, why is it a criterion? So you see that we had some um, necessary conditions that if the Euler cycle exists, uh, of course, each vertex should have even degree because the number of incoming and outgoing uh, edges for this Euler cycle should be the same and uh, it should be connected because otherwise there could be no Euler cycle. But now we are in doubt why there are no other uh, obstacles against the existence of an Euler cycle. Maybe the graph is connected and each vertex has an even degree, but uh, nevertheless, it uh, does not have an Euler cycle. And uh, I think this will be, say, proving this theorem along with uh, solving 5b will be left for the next class. Uh, I will have to stop in five minutes and therefore I will announce the necessary uh, notions for 6. So for problem 6, uh, there is this, we know what the bipartite graph is. So now we have already a bipartite graph which is given as the input data. And now, what is the perfect matching for problem six? So, a perfect matching is the following thing. Uh, you have uh, two parts of the graph again, V1, V2. And uh, you have these guys here. There should be the same number of them like this. And a matching is you take uh, some of the edges and you mark them uh, so that they do not have uh, common. So, for example, here you have this matching. You match this with this, this with, but this can be not matched because there is no edge, and you can not match it with that, for example. So. Um, you see that matching M is just uh, a subset of E such that uh, if, say, U1, V1 is in M and U2, V2 is in M, then uh, they are different. So U1 is not U, U2, it's for bipartite only, and V1 is not V2. So you cannot do in a matching, you cannot mark both. This, is, this situation is uh, not permitted. And a perfect matching, so M is perfect if uh, it covers all V1 and V2. So this means that all the vertices are covered by this perfect matching. 
So for this graph, we would try to find a matching. This one is not perfect, but we could fix it by not taking this edge. So this edge, well, it, it is still in the graph, but it's not, not uh, yellow. It's not inside the matching, so it's here. And we rematch in the following way. So this comes to this, and this comes to this. So this is a perfect matching. And uh, so we have, we have students, we have assignments, we have to match it. Each student performs exactly one assignment. And uh, no student performs two assignments, and each student performs at least one, and each assignment is fulfilled. So, of course, there is a, a that this, there is a necessary condition that uh, the edges should be uh, the number of vertices in both parts should be the same because otherwise you cannot match, of course. But this is, of course, not, an, not a uh, sufficient condition because, for example, you could have something like that. You have this and that, you have three here, you have three here, and this guy is connected to two, and this guy is connected to two. So such a graph does not have a perfect matching, while it's uh, by apartheid and uh, both parts have the same number of vertices. So the question is how to guess, uh, so you can guess the perfect matching, so it's de definitely an NP problem, checking that the, it's a matching and it is perfect. It's of course that doable in polynomial time, but uh, nevertheless, uh, the question here is whether you can do it in uh, polynomial time just to uh, find out whether such a matching exists. So 5b and 6ab, they go for your home thinking. And um, uh, also, I would like to announce that in the next class, we will discuss in the lecture, we will discuss Network X, which is a graph framework in Python, and the final homework will be assigned. So uh, if there are no questions, we are supposed to end here. Thank you for attending the class and uh, for attention. Степан Львович, а можно задать несколько уточняющих вопросов по поводу первого ДЗ? Да, вполне. If, if possible, you could... Uh, okay, you can ask them in Russian, but I will answer in English, because other people could be also interested. Хорошо, понял. Я хотел уточнить, я же правильно понимаю, что у нас вот в первом ДЗ в качестве классов uh, вот этой uh, формулы могут быть только либо простая импликация, двух литералов, либо дизъюнкция двух литералов. То есть не может быть условного отрицания импликации, да? Okay, yeah, the question was as follows, that um, in the home assignment, which is homework number one, uh, what is the form of the literal? So the literals, let me just, I will share the screen right now. Mm. Here is the official formulation of the task, which is on GitHub, and there is a link from the course web page. So each clause can be either of this form, a disjunction of two literals, or implication from one literal to another, where each literal is either a variable like P or not P, where not is denoted by the symbol called tiled. It looks like a minus here, but it's a tiled. So this is a, an example, and this is exhaustive. So you can also have not P, but uh, you can, uh, the, the question was asked, whether you can have a negation of an implication, no. Such a clause is not a DNF, a CNF clause, and this is not allowed here. Yeah, this is the, the answer to the question. Ага, понял. И еще можно уточняющий вопрос один. Я правильно понимаю, что название какой-то логической переменной может быть любой длины? То есть это не обязательно просто какая-то одна латинская буква? Или это строго одна латинская буква? Well, uh, the question was that whether you can use longer names than just one or one Latin letter for your variables. Well, uh, formally speaking, yes, you, you should allow long ones, but in the tests uh, there are only one one letter. So if it's more convenient for you to have only one letter, you are fine. Понял, спасибо. И еще такой вопрос. В формулировке задания написано, что нужно написать одну функцию. Вот у меня такой вопрос. Я могу написать отдельную функцию, которую парсит строку в какой-то удобный мне формат, и просто вот в необходимых функциях, типа, is satisfiable, ее вызывать внутри, в самом теле функции? 
Yes, of course. These are the, the functions which are the final ones which do the job. But you can, of course, introduce new functions which uh, do the parsing or do anything else. So, of course, you can you can write many functions. But this technical detail is just that your functions which yield the final answer should have the corresponding names. Otherwise, the tests will just fail to find them. Of course, you, of course, you can. You are not uh, obliged to. Oh, do all this, the stuff inside one functions. You can add auxiliary functions as you wish. Ага, понял. Еще раз спасибо. И еще вопрос. Я правильно что я правильно понимаю, что нет никакого ограничения по сложности алгоритмов и так далее. То есть, если я просто, допустим, использую какой-то такой прямой экспоненциальный алгоритм для перебора, то его можно использовать в качестве основного алгоритма. <laughs> yes, well, well, you are actually, of course, uh, well, the, the tests, of course, will pass. Yes, you, you, formally speaking, I couldn't, uh, I don't have time just to analyze all the code and find out what algorithm we use. But of course, you are uh, encouraged and entitled to, to write a polynomial time algorithm. But this is the purpose of the test. Но если не получится, то можно писать экспоненциальный и баллы не снижаются. But this is this is this is discouraged. But formally speaking, you will pass the test, and of course you will get the good grade for that. Yes, but 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 you are encouraged to understand a resolution and uh, apply it or any other polynomial time algorithm, of course. Uh, te theoretically, the tests could fail just by uh, this uh, time overflow. It could happen. I don't know whether this. I didn't put any formal uh, limits, because this could be tedious, but uh, nevertheless, they could fail by timeout. Then you will have to write something faster. I understand. Thank you. And I have a few organization questions. I just listened to you when you talked about the exam. Can you please repeat it briefly, when it will be? Is there a deadline? Yeah. I listened to you. Yeah. 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 You have this half semester, which is called the module in the, at this university, right? Uh, so uh, after this module ends, so the, the last our last last lecture and class will be on uh, October 13. So this means that the next week, which starts with October 18, it will be your uh, exam period. Uh, I, there will be a specific date booked for this exam. I think it will be just the next Wednesday, which is uh, October the 20th. And I will write all this on the web page in the due course. And uh, there will be the exam. The exam is in written form. It contributes half of your final grade. It's obligatory for all the students attending the course. And uh, we decided to make it uh, also a take-home one. So it will, be uh, it will be online. So I will publish the... Uh, exam materials, we do problems for you to solve, and then I will collect the uh, results by email after a good deadline. So, uh, since this is not a long-term home assignment, then you will have to just uh, one day for that, not say, like a week or something like that. But uh, this will be 24 hours. This is uh, done for the following reason, that uh, you... Um, uh, different people can potentially be in different time zones. And in order to accommodate this, we'll give a 24-hour frame, starting from the publication of the material and up to the deadline. You submit it to me by email, and I, then I'll grade it and submit the results to the study office. Ага, понял, спасибо. И еще, извините, что так долго вас мучу, еще тогда вопрос. Я правильно понимаю, что из тех активностей, за которые мы можем получить баллы, это вот первое ДЗ, у которого дедлайн 5 октября, второе ДЗ, которое вот вы вчера выложили, у него дедлайн 6 числа, и экзамен. То есть вот это вот три источника. Что еще раз? There will be the third home assignment, which will be put on online next week, for one week. So there are three awesome. home assignments and the exam. And the third assignment will be posted after the deadlines for the first two ones. It will be on graphs, also programming assignment in Python. It will be graded in two points and will, will, will be much easier than the first one. Therefore, it's just for one week and uh, it will be uh, graded maximum of two points. And first and second are maximum of 
four points. And your accumulated grade will be give you maximum of 10, and then it will be, will be uh, also combined with the result for the final exam. Ага, но oh. если я, допустим, напишу... Да, 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 да. Прошу, oh, this will be on, on the website. Uh, maybe even tonight or something like that. Ага, ну то есть гипотетически, если я за все 3 ДЗ набираю максимальные баллы, то я могу экзамен написать, у меня будет десятка. No, no, no. I, um, in, I think in this course uh, we do not use this... Uh, Think that you can just uh, pass all the uh, home tasks and get your maximal point because in the exam we have something which is not inside this home assignments. So all the students have to go to the exam. This is it's uh, uh, 0.5 for the home tasks plus 0.5 for the exam, rounded upwards. Ah, все, понял, большое спасибо. Yeah, I'll publish the grading formula this week, I think, yeah. just, just for you to understand. Спасибо большое. Вы на все вопросы мы ответили. Больше даже нечего спрашивать. Спасибо. Okay. So, then thank you all for coming. Thank you for your attention. And we reconvene in a week. Good luck with the home assignments. Thank you.